And I recognize that um, in this room, we come from a lot of different uh, church backgrounds. Uh, many of us are, if you will allow me to use the term, Church of Christers. Uh, maybe several generations worth in, in our family. And, and then we've got uh, people who grew up Baptist or Presbyterian or Catholic or maybe didn't grow up going to church at all. We got a whole lot of different religious experiences, for, I, I guess we could say, uh, represented just in this room this morning. And depending on where you grew up uh, going to church or what experiences that, that you had growing up, there were those certain songs that when you sing them, Man, it resonates with you. It brings back all sorts of memories, all sorts of good stuff. And then there's other songs that every time you open the book to it or it comes up on the screen, you're like, oh, this one. Me? That's just me? I didn't hear any. Okay. I didn't see not a head. So maybe it's just me. There's certain songs that like, oh, man. It's, it's a good song. The message is good. It just never really resonated with me. Or we sang it so much that it's just like, man, we're singing this again. Do you have any songs? You don't have to call them out. Just, do you have songs like that that you experienced in your church background? Okay. I'm saying that because, you know, we just got done singing the song, The Greatest Commands. And it's a song taken from Scripture. I mean, the lyrics of the song that we just sang is all Scripture. And, uh, and the parts and the way they blend together is awesome. The first time that I heard that song, I was like, oh, this is amazing. It's an amazing song. Whoever came up with this whole uh, melody, it's awesome. And I know some of you guys feel the same way. And every time that you sing, that we sing that song together, you think of different places where you sung it or different people that you sung that song with. And maybe it was at, on a college campus and, and you were joined hands or maybe at a, at a church camp session. That's where we sang a lot or different youth group things when I was doing youth ministry. But I know I know because I've had conversations with people in this room who I am not call out by name, but I know there are people, especially some of us Church of Christers, that as soon as that song popped up on the screen, we're like, oh, man, seriously? Because we, we, there were years ago, not so recently, but years ago, we sang it all the time, and it just got old. It just got kind of played. You know what I'm saying? Do you have songs like that? Okay. I, I bring that up. <laughs> Because one of those songs, when I used to go to church camp, I, every summer we take our kids uh, from this youth, youth group, and there's kids from all over uh, this area to go to the Green Valley Bible Camp. And I directed a week-long session at Green Valley Bible Camp. But just so you know, I grew up going to Green Valley Bible Camp as well. And there was a song, Carl, you may remember this. This will probably bring back some memories. Carl Duncan and I used to go to camp together. Um, there was a stretch there in the... In the 80s and 90s, a long time ago, boys and girls, uh, when, when I was in junior high and high school and I was a teenager, and they used to do this thing, every camp session at Green Valley did it. They called it, they called it Singspiration. Reagan, you remember this? Singspiration. And on one night of the week, usually the Thursday night or Friday night, all the different cabins uh, would get up and they would sing some songs. And it would be like a little choir performance. They would be up on stage and they would sing some songs and everybody would clap, you know, and it would be all good. And, it, you know, the younger uh, campers would sing songs that were kind of easy for them to sing. And then you got the, the kind of the middle age where especially the guys kind of going through puberty and voices are changing. Those are a lot more mumbled lyrics of songs. And then you get to the older campers, and especially the oldest ones, they would, they would really practice and really belt out some really good songs. And for a stretch there for a little while, every singspiration that I was a part of, the oldest cabin would sing a song that was actually recorded in the 80s by a, a Christian artist named Michael W. Smith called Friends or Friends Forever. Anybody remember this song? Okay. If you've never heard this song before, don't listen to it right now because I want you to listen to me. But you know, look it up, listen to it. The message is awesome. It's a wonderful song. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's the chorus is friends are friends forever. And at the end of it, a lifetime's not too long to live as friends. It's all about friendship and these, and these bonds that we've made. And, of course, if you're at the end of, a, of the week of a, of a, you know, hot summer week at camp, you're tired, uh, emotions are running high, and as soon as, as soon as that first lyric, all these, all these older campers be standing up front, and as soon as that first lyric, packing up the dreams God's planted, girls, I mean, makeup's running. Girls are just crying. They're holding hands and stuff. And it got to the point for me, 
I can't hear that song without laughing. I'll be honest with you, okay? <laughs> uh, by the time my senior year of high school rolled around, me and my buddies were back on the back row making fun of everybody that's, that's crying on the front row. I'm confessing that to you. That's not what I should have done. That's, that's just how I felt. Friends, for, friends are friends forever. That was, that was one of those songs that at least in, in, you know, Christian circles at the time, that's when we talked about friendship, that's one of the songs that came to your mind. And it really is a good song. I, I challenge you to listen to it. I'm sorry, I've probably ruined it for most of you that haven't heard it before. But uh, it, was, it was a great song, but it just kind of got played. And I'm wondering if, if that's how we, some of you feel this morning about singing the greatest commands. Where, I mean, look at these scriptures that we just sang about. Where God says, man, I am love. And I have shown you love. And, and because of the love that I, that I am and, and, and the love that constitutes me and the love that I've shown you, you need to love each other that way. And what a great uh, picture of what true friendship should look like with the words of the songs we just sang. But you can think of other songs, right, that talk about friendship. I mean, Buzz and Woody on Toy Story, what do they sing? You've got a friend in me. Yeah, we recognize that one. Anybody ever watch the TV show Friends? What's the theme song? I'll, <laughs> thank you, Rachel. Two hands. Yes, I watch it. <laughs> I'll be there for you. And they list all the different times that they're going to be there for you. Dionne Warwick, back in the 80s. That's what friends are for. The Beatles, even for her. I get by with a little help from my friends. Garth Brooks even said he had friends where? In low places. Everybody knows that one, right? Can we, can, we sing, can we mention that at church? I feel like we can. I feel like that's okay. All right. I bring this up today because I want us to be thinking about this concept of, of friendship. And when we talk about friends, when you hear about friends, I mean, you start thinking about songs that talk about friendship, TV shows, movies that you watch that epitomize, uh, you know, friendship at its best level. And I want us to be thinking about that as we continue this morning talking about next level relationships. We've been talking about this for a few weeks now, recognizing that that we have all these different connections, all these different relationships. And some of those things uh, may not necessarily be awful. They may not need a major overhaul, maybe some tweaking or just some improvement. I've been in this relationship, this connection with this person for this amount of time, and I want things to be even better than they are. And that could be in our marriages, and that could be within our families, as we talked about last week. It could be with coworkers. It could be with our friends. And that's what we want to talk about this morning. Next level friendships. How do I take my friendships to the next level? We're not talking about this morning, just just to kind of preface this ahead of time, I'm not talking about how to make friends, uh, how to walk up to a total stranger and go, okay, we're going to be friends now. I'm not talking about the best way to go about doing that. I'm not necessarily even talking about how to um, renew or reconcile a friendship that's been completely severed or become disconnected for whatever reason. Although there's probably some things we're going to be talking about that would help with that as we talk about those things today. But what I want you to be thinking about is just, I mean, think about the people in your life right now. Who comes to your mind when you think of just, these are my friends? I'm sure there's some faces that come to mind, some names that come to mind. These are the people that that are either my best friends or we're really good friends, we're really close. Who are those people? Could that connection, could that relationship be better than what it is now. Could that friendship be taken to the next level? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. And there's all sorts of things that can cause any of our friendships to become stagnant, uh, to, to kind of fizzle, to kind of fade a little bit. We need to take an honest look at, at our friendships, or maybe just that one particular relationship, that person that we've been friends with, but it's not the same as what it used to be. Or it's kind of, it's, it's never gotten any better than what it is. It's just kind of stayed at the same level. And if I want that to improve, what, what's happened that's caused that to not be everything that it could be? Well, several different things I think can cause that, can cause these relationships and these friendships to suffer a little bit, or at least to begin to fade. And one of those things is just, honestly, just laziness. I mean, being in a relationship, any relationship, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a family relationship, whether it's a friendship, that takes work. It takes effort. It takes time. It requires, it requires commitment if 
if this relationship is going to continue to be healthy and continue to grow, I've got to put some effort into it. It doesn't just happen. And if I'm not willing to put in time and effort, not only to just maintain this relationship, but actually improve and, and, and help it to get stronger, then it's not going to. It's never going to be any better than what it currently is, and it might end up fading away. If I spend the bulk of my time and my focus scrolling through social media and binge watching Netflix and staying within my, my bubble and my comfort zone, then there won't be much effort going into building trust, building connection, spending time getting to know each other better because I'm not committing time and energy and focus on you. It's just laziness. Sometimes it's, it's self-centeredness. That can, that can damage a friendship. I mean, any relationship, again, marriage, parents and kids, friendships, those relationships involve two people. And in order for, for that relationship uh, to, to grow, I can't just make it all about me. It can't just all be about what I need or what I want for us to do. There has to be some times where I take my focus off of me and focus on you. What's on your heart? What needs do you have? What do you want to go do? There's got to be some give and take. And if I'm completely self-centered and focused on me, then this friendship is never going to grow past where it is right now, if it's going to grow at all. Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's my own fear of what you might think of me if this friendship continues to grow. I might want to keep my friendship superficial, surface level. I might let you know, uh, you know, a little bit of information about my family, maybe a little bit about my, my background, some things I like or don't like, some foods I like to eat or don't like to eat. But we're going to keep everything kind of on the surface. And sometimes the reason that I don't want to go any deeper in that in a friendship or relationship is because, is because of my own fear. I limit what I want you to really see about me because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what, if you really got to know me, what are you really going to think of me? If you really knew my failures and my flaws and my mistakes, you might walk away. I fear that if you really got to know some things about me and got to really know who I am, you might go tell somebody else what it was that you discovered. And so instead of risking that, instead of risking that trust, instead of risking being completely open and honest with you and sharing those things with you, I keep everything on the surface. Just what, just what you can see. And that's, that's as deep as this friendship's going to go. It's my own fear that may keep this, this friendship from going to the next level. Sometimes it's because of hurt. You may have made a mistake in the past and hurt my feelings in some way. You may have done something or, or said something, and you, and you may need, not even know that you did something to hurt my feelings, but it did. I may be the one who has done something. I may have said something to you that was hurtful. I may have done something to you uh, that was hurtful. I never intended to, but... but I caused some kind of hurt to happen. And whatever the circumstances, whatever the reason behind it, I can sometimes choose to keep this friend at a distance. We're never going to get any closer than what we really are because I have chosen not to let go of whatever it is that you did or said. Because you have hurt me or, or maybe you're keeping me at a distance because I've hurt you and, and I haven't reconciled that in any way. But there's this hurt, there's this, there's this disconnection between us because of something that we did or something that we said. And, and until that's resolved, this relationship is never going to grow beyond what it is right now. And these are just some of the things. These are just, are just some of the circumstances that can cause any one of our relationships to stay at a certain level, to never, to never grow, to never improve. And what I want to do for just a few minutes this morning is talk about how do, we, how do I change that? How do I take this friendship? I've got this person in my life, and I don't want to lose this person. I value the friendship, but we're just kind of stuck at this, at this certain level. How do I take this friendship to the next level? And I'll say this ahead of time. I don't think that, that one of the action steps should be you know, necessarily walking up to your friend out of the blue and going, okay, I'm going to take this friendship to the next level. That'd be kind of awkward. I mean, maybe you've got a good enough relationship with that person where you can say that. But for most of us, that'd be kind of weird for one of my friends to walk up to me and go, all right, next level, we're starting today. <laughs> what? I also don't, I, I want to make sure that we're not, 
with some of these things I'm going to share with you, that we're not being manipulative. And what I mean by that is some of these actions that I might start taking to try to improve this relationship, I don't need to come at it from a heart of, I want you to do things for me. And so I'm going to kind of say and do things with that motivation in mind. I want you to treat me a certain way, and because I want to treat you to treat me a certain way, I'm going to say things or do things where you'll start treating me a certain way. That'll make more sense here in a minute. But I don't want us to be manipulative either. That's going to hurt the friendship more than it's going to help. So what are some things that I can do? How do I take this relationship, this friendship, uh, to the next level? Well, I think there's one principle that we need to keep in mind over all these different actions. And we mentioned it last week, and I want to bring it to you again. It's in the book of Luke in chapter 6. So if you've got your Bibles, if you've got your Bible apps, feel free to go to the book of Luke. Most of our scripture is going to be on the screen today, and you're welcome to look up there as well. Luke chapter 6 and verse 31, Jesus says this, Do to others as you would have them do to you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, again, we can twist that into a very manipulative situation. I'm going to do things so that you'll do even better things for me. That's not what Jesus says here. And I want to be clear on that. Jesus says, is there a certain way that you wish you were being treated? Is there a certain way that you would want people to treat you? Then do that for somebody else. I'm, I'm using how I want to be treated as a guy for how I should treat others, whether they treat me that way or not. You see the difference? I'm not sitting here saying, Jesus isn't sitting here saying, do unto others so that they will do unto you. Do you want people to treat you good? Then go treat people good. Model for people what it is that you hope to receive from them. But you may never not, you may never receive it from them. They may never treat you the way you wish you're going to be treated. Doesn't matter. That's not part of the rule. Do to others what you would have them do to you. Treat people the way that, that they need to be treated. You need to be able, if, if we're going to move this friendship to the next level, you need to be able to see some changes in me and, and experience a difference in, in how I treat you before I can ever expect anything different from you. So I want us to keep this principle in mind. I want us to keep this, this uh, command from Jesus in mind as we talk about some of these actions that we can take, some things that we can do differently to improve our friendships. And the first thing that, that we can do to improve our friendships, to, to take them to the next level, is, is I can invest in this person. I can invest time. I can invest energy in this person. When I invest in something financially, which for me is not very often, but when I invest in something financially, I am taking some of my money and I'm, I'm putting it to work in the hopes that it produces even more than what I put into it. That's the purpose of investment. That's the purpose of financial investment. When I invest in a person, I'm not investing money, I'm investing energy, I'm investing time, I'm investing priorities, I'm investing pride, I'm investing effort in that person. I'm giving something of myself to that person. I'm investing myself in that person and spending my energy and my emotions on that person in the hopes that that relationship and that connection will grow even stronger than it was before I started. That we'll be more deeply connected than we were a few weeks, a few months, a few years ago. In Proverbs, Solomon says, in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17 is, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I don't have a whole lot of tools in my shed. I don't possess any sharpening tools in my toolbox. Some of you do. Uh, if I need the blade sharpened on the mower, I go take it to somebody who has that stuff, and they sharpen it for me. But I think you, even if you don't know that much about sharpening, you understand the sharpening process. And Solomon, he, I mean, he could be talking about, you know, farm tools, axe heads, swords, knives, whatever it is that you're wanting to sharpen. Part of the process of sharpening that thing is, is putting that thing in contact with something else. And that friction obviously helps to make it sharper, but it's, it's, it's that constant contact. It's, it's getting rid of the, of the rough edges. It's 
contact with each other that causes those things to become sharper, to become better. And he says the same thing happens with our relationships, with our friendships. The more time that we invest in each other, the sharper we become. The better we are at handling different situations in our lives, the closer our personal friendship becomes because we're spending time with each other. We're connected with each other. If you take two pieces of metal and you get them about this close to each other and you do the whole rubbing process, but they never come into contact, what's going to happen? Nothing. I can come sit down the road from you at church. We can live down the street from each other in the neighborhood. I can have my lawn chairs, a few lawn chairs over from your lawn chair at our kids' practice. And if we're not actually investing in each other and spending time connecting with each other, nothing's going to happen. We're going to stay exactly the same or that friendship's going to fade away. We need to invest, I need to invest in you to make this relationship stronger, to take this friendship Uh, to the next level. I need to be more trustable. I need to be more trustable. One of the hallmarks of a true friendship is trust. It's it's, It's me knowing that I can share anything with you and not be judged for it. Knowing that I can be myself around you and you'll like me anyway. Knowing that you're not gonna gossip to other people about any of the things that I share with you or any of the things that you've seen in me, knowing that, that even if there's a time when you criticize me in some way, when you point out something that I need to be doing different or need to be doing better, then I recognize that's coming from a place where you actually care about me. That's what trust in a friendship is all about. And sometimes one of the main reasons that a friendship between me and another person remains stagnant or, or, or fades away altogether is because that person doesn't know that they can trust me. They don't know, you know that, that I'm not going to judge them for whatever it is that they've done or said. They don't know for sure that if I have something negative to say that that comes from a, from a heart that wants the best for them. They haven't, they haven't learned that they haven't learned that they can trust me. They haven't learned that they that, that that I'm not going to gossip about them. And so I invest more time in that friendship and I invest more time in that person and, and in this relationship and in that process, hopefully they learn that they can trust me, they can share with me. But part of the process of me becoming trustable is learning to trust. Being willing to share something of myself with this other person. Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, verse 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Do I tell the little things that friends share with me? Do I say, hey, I'm going to do this for you, and then I don't actually do it? Am I quick to criticize and quick to judge about seemingly insignificant things, then Jesus says, I'm probably going to do the same thing about the big stuff. When there's really hurt going on in their lives, they can't trust me because they couldn't trust me about the little stuff. When there's a big mistake, when, they, when they're feeling like something they've done is, is, is making them into a complete failure, they're not going to share that stuff with me. Why? Because I criticized them over the little stuff. This person that I am friends with needs to be able to trust me, even about the little things, so that our friendship can go to the next level, and they can trust me about the big stuff, too. I need to be better at at, um, forgiving. I need to invest in this person. I need to be more trustful. I need to forgive. And the reason that, maybe the reason that this friendship of ours is not growing stronger, is not uh, getting better, we're not, we don't have a deeper connection, is this, again, something's happened in the past, and I'm choosing to hold on to it. Maybe I misunderstood something that you said. Maybe you said something, you, you, you were joking with me, and I didn't take it as a joke. Uh, maybe you did something to somebody else that I care about, and, and that hurt me in some way. Maybe you didn't keep your word. Maybe you said, I want to do this for you, and then you didn't do that for you. And maybe that happened multiple times, and now I'm just just mad. And whatever it is, 
Whatever it is that you have done, I'm choosing to hold on to it. Or the vice versa could be true. I could have done those things. I could have said something that you misunderstood. I could have said something hurtful when I was trying to be funny and I wasn't. I could have done something or not done something that I said that I was going to do. And you're choosing to hold on to it. And whatever it is, whatever that, that, that disconnection is, we're not letting it go. We're not forgiving it. We're not moving forward in this relationship because I can't get past fill in the blank. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13, we need to bear with each other. That's a pretty important phrase right there. We need to bear with each other. That goes beyond just putting up with each other, tolerating each other. Paul says we need to share in this life together. We need, to, we need to carry burdens for each other. When there's something that's going on in your life that's too heavy and it's weighing you down, I need to be the one to, to see it and to come rush to your side and help you carry it. If I can, lift it off of you. That's what bearing with each other means. We need to bear with each other and carry burdens together and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Quick question. How much is Jesus forgiven you of? You don't have to answer out loud. How long would that list be if you started writing them all down? Think of all the things that Jesus has forgiven you of. Think of all the things that, you're, that you hope nobody else ever finds out about, but he knows and he forgave you of it anyway. Think about all the things you said, I will never, ever do that again, and you did it again the next day, and he forgave you anyway. Think of all the times that you've broken God's heart, and he loved you anyway. And Paul says, you've experienced that kind of grace. You've experienced that kind of forgiveness, and now I want you to do that for who? Each other. And when somebody does something that's hurtful, yeah, it's hurtful. And yeah, we, got, we may need to address it and deal with it. But I'm going to let go of it. I'm going to forgive it. And maybe the biggest thing about this I need to understand is my forgiveness, and I've talked about this with church family before, but I want to remind us of it. My forgiveness is not dependent on you asking for it. Forgiveness is about me letting go of whatever it is. Whatever hurt that I felt, whatever action you've taken that's bothered me in some way, I'm not going to bother with it anymore. I'm not going to hold on to it. I'm not going to hold it over your head. I'm not going to treat you any different because of it. I'm going to let it go. Hopefully, you recognize that you have hurt me in some way, and we can talk about that and address it, and I forgive it. And especially if you come to me and say, please forgive me of that. I'm so sorry I did that. I definitely need to be the one to forgive it. But that's not the stipulation that Paul puts here. Paul says, forgive as Jesus Christ has forgiven you. How much has he forgiven me of? Everything. Have I always asked for forgiveness for the stuff that I've done? To hurt him or to hurt others? That's not what his forgiveness and grace is dependent on. And mine's not supposed to be either. Does that make sense? Sometimes this friendship is only going to stay where it is because I won't forgive something that has happened in the past. And until I choose to let go of it, until I choose to forgive it, it's always going to be there. And maybe even the bigger, the bigger piece of this forgiveness thing we, we see in Proverbs, uh, back with Solomon again, chapter 17 and verse 9. Where he says, whoever with foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. How often am I the person who, okay, I forgive you, we're done, and then when the situation comes up again, or when I get upset, months, maybe years on down the road. You remember that one time you fill in the blank. I'm sure that's none of us in this room, right? We don't bring up other people's past mistakes, especially if we said they're forgiven. Okay, I'll confess, sometimes I do. Solomon says, you know what happens when you do that? You kill the friendship. You sever that connection. You don't make it stronger. When I keep bringing up stuff from the past, it makes a friendship worse. 
it crumbles it. It doesn't take it to the next level. So, if something's happened, the first thing I want to do is forgive it. The second thing I want to do is not tell other people about it. It's not their business. And that'll probably just make things worse anyway. And the third thing I'm going to do is I'm going to keep from continually bringing it up and throwing it back in your face. It's forgiven. It's forgotten. Let's move on. The last thing that can help move my friendship to the next level is love. To truly love this person, to truly show love to this person. And if I truly want to move this, this friendship from where it is now, I need to do my best to show love to you and compassion for you and a willingness to serve you and to help you in any way I can, even if you don't do those things in return for me. Just like forgiveness is not dependent on you coming and asking for it, my love and the way I show my love for you is not dependent on that being reciprocated. There's a story told uh, in John chapter 13 of the night before um, Jesus died. And if you've been raised in the church, you, you've probably heard the story multiple times where Jesus is gathered around with his disciples. They're eating this meal and they realize, or somebody at some point, Jesus at least realizes, nobody's washing anybody's feet. And when you've walked around in sandals through dirt and dust and animal stuff all day, and you come into a house and you don't sit at a table with chairs, you lay around on cushions where your feet might possibly be in somebody else's face. It was a really nice thing to do when you came in the house in the first place to wash all that stuff off. And nobody had done it. And one of the reasons nobody had done it is because nobody thought that they were the ones who needed to do it. That's, that's, that's the stinky job. That's a low job. That's a low level job. And I'm kind of above that. And who are you for me to have to wash your feet? And that was kind of the attitude. And so during the meal, Jesus gets up, and he goes around, and he washes the disciples' feet. A couple of key things I want to point out about that this morning that you may have forgotten or may have missed altogether. If you go back to the beginning of that story, before Jesus ever gets up, in John chapter 13, and verse 1, here's these key words. And if you've got your Bibles, I invite you to underline it, highlight it, if there's some way to do that on the Bible app that you have, I'd recommend that you do that. Look at how John describes this. He says, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. And he's surrounded by guys he spent the last three years with. And they've been, they've been intimately involved in each other's lives. They've... they've walked hundreds of miles together. He's, he's, uh, they've witnessed him performing miracles, and he's given them power to do the same. They've taught people. They've helped people. They've shared with people. It's been an amazing journey. They've been around each other day after day, engaging each other's lives. This is a close connection that he has with the guys in this room. And John says, in that moment, before he's going to go to the cross, before he's going to go through this, this whole experience where he, for, where he takes on and forgives the sins of the world, he wants to show the people who, who he has grown closest to while he's here on this earth the full extent of his love. How does he do it? He goes over in the corner, and he picks up a towel and a bucket of water and starts washing feet. And one by one, he comes to each one of them, and he kneels down, and he starts scraping that stuff off and rubbing their feet and drying them. And if any one of them said, Jesus, why are you doing this? What would his response be? It's because I love you. I wanted you to know. I don't want you to miss the point. The way Jesus showed his friends they loved him was by serving him. He could have said it all he wanted to, but he got up and he did something with it. He showed them how much he cared about him. He showed them how much compassion he had for him because he loved them. Here's one other thing about this. If you read through the rest of John chapter 13, 
The scripture doesn't say that anybody washed Jesus' feet. Now, maybe he washed off his own. Or maybe when he was putting everything back over in the corner, somebody came over and washed his feet. We don't know for sure because scripture doesn't say it. And the reason I point that out to you is because Jesus went around washing all this nasty stuff off of his friend's feet because he loved them that much and he didn't expect anything in return. Jesus didn't get done washing their feet and then say, okay, who's doing mine? Because that's not what love is. When I love you, I do things for you because I love you. Whether you do anything for me or not. You see that? If I will get in the habit of doing that more with my friends, that's going to take that friendship to the next level. When I show you how much I care about you, how much compassion I have for you, how much you mean to me, whether you do anything to reciprocate that or not, it's going to make that relationship a whole lot better. I need to invest in you. I need to be more trustable for you. I need to forgive you. I need to love you. That's what's going to take this friendship that we have to the next level. I'm going to wrap up with a different thought, guys, this morning than what I have on the last slide. In the book of Philippians, I'll wrap up with this. In the book of Philippians, chapter 1, as Paul, the Apostle Paul, is writing to this church in Philippi, and he, he cares about them deeply, he loves them with all of his heart. He has a special connection with them compared to the other churches that, that he had had connections with over the years. He's sitting in prison. He's got chains on his wrists and probably shackles on his feet. And he's writing this letter, and he's, and he's reaching out to them. The first thing, one of the first things that he says in Philippians chapter 1, it's not going to be on the screen, but you can look at it yourself. He, he basically says, this is Paul. I'm writing to you guys in Philippi. And in verse 3, here's the first thing out of, Paul's, uh, out of Paul's pen, first thing that's on his heart. I thank my God for you. My question as we wrap up this morning, who is it in your life besides a spouse, besides your kids, besides maybe even your parents, who is that friend in your life? Who is that person in your life that you would say, I thank God for you. Every time I think of you, I thank God for you. We need those kind of people in our lives. Here's my second question. Who do you think would say that about you? Who's in your life that would say, man, every time I think of him, every time I see her face, I thank God that he put that person in my life. Because that's the kind of person I need to be. I need to be the kind of person that other people are thankful for. I need to be the kind of person that people are, are, are thinking to themselves, when I think of him, man, I'm, I thank God for him. Not so that they'll pat me on the back, not so that I can walk around and go, look how awesome I am, that people thank God for me. Woo! But because I've showed them that much love, that much compassion, that much grace, that much connection, that much time, that much effort, that much devotion that they can't help but thank God for me. That's the kind of person I want to be. I want to be thanked for, not thought negatively of, don't you? So let's go start being those kind of people. At least with our friends. At least with that one friend. How can I start being more forgiving? How can I start being more loving? How can I build that trust? What can I do today to start investing in another person? Our friendship will never be the same if I start focusing on those things. So we're going to stand together in just a second. We're going to sing a song about being shaped into the person that God could make us into. And asking him to do that. And I would invite you as we're singing the song to take a quick evaluation of some of your friendships, some of your relationships. And if you know, man, I need to go this week. I need to go sometime this month. I need to go today and find that person and say, you know what? I've held something 
between us for a long time. I'm ready to be done with it. I'm ready to forgive it, or I hope you'll forgive me, and let's move on. If you can think of that one person, as we're talking about being shaped and refined by God, if you can think of that one person and say, God, make me into who they need me to be in this relationship, I hope that you'll pray that prayer. And if we can help as a church family, I hope you'll come forward and say, I'm ready to be made into something new. I'm ready to be made into what my friends need me to be. And we will surround you with love and prayer and whatever help that we can. But let's not walk out of here being the same people we were when we walked in. Let's commit to taking our friendships and relationships to the next level, starting today. If this church can help, we want to. While together we stay in the same.